The aquamarine brilliance of Lake Berkeley. The imposing concrete edifice of Crotty Dam. The exquisite engineering excellence that has burrowed a tunnel under a massive mountain. And a power station named after one of Tasmania's pioneers. They all combine to form the King River Power Development. Its home is Tasmania's west coast, where the roaring 40s bring rain in generous quantities. Rain which, through the irresistible meld of modern engineering skill and plain, old-fashioned hard yakka, can be channelled into producing clean electricity. Tasmania's Hydroelectric Commission has built an international reputation for such schemes over 78 years of operation. Together with the Anthony Power Scheme, a little further north, the King River Power Development marks the end of an era for the state and for its hydro. Economic and environmental factors have contrived to ensure that there will be no more large hydro schemes in Tasmania for the foreseeable future. The era of dam building is marked by design and construction achievements that have made the world sit up and take notice. As a final, enduring symbol of these, the Crotty Dam is the first concrete-faced rock-fill dam to have a spillway on its downstream face. That piece of jargon rolls off the engineer's tongue as smoothly as water will flow down the spillway. However, constructing power developments is considerably more than engineering jargon. It's about brave women and men who work in the harshest of elements. It's about people thrown together in communities who build a comradeship that will last long after the construction town with its transportable buildings and makeshift infrastructure has been reclaimed by the wilderness. It's about doing something that will benefit thousands of Australians for decades to come. It's about the King River power development. The King scheme began in 1983 when the Australian High Court blocked the Gordon Belay Franklin development, a landmark in Tasmanian political, economic and environmental history. The government of the day authorised the building of the King and Anthony schemes to ensure that a proud and highly qualified workforce remained in place and that Tasmania had power to meet its needs into the 90s and beyond into the next century. The area in which the scheme was to be built already had a long history of contributing to the economic welfare of Tasmania. The King River in Barnes and nearby Queenstown have a rich mining history, stretching as far back as 1860, when the area was struck by gold fever. Part of that history is James Crotty, an Irishman with a reputation for being a rogue and a scholar. He developed the town of Crotty, which the azure waters of Lake Burberry now cover. To ensure that his life's work was not lost to perpetuity, the Hydra commissioned archaeologists to sift through the remnants of the town before the inundation. The survey was undertaken as part of the environmental work in the valley and uh, before the flooding occurs, and there's European historic sites and Aboriginal prehistoric sites here, and it was important to document them before the uh, flooding occurred. Well, we found a lot of uh, glass and ceramics from day-to-day -day use at the site, and they're important because they give you a, a sort of information and detail about how people were living on the site and what their level of material culture was. The Hydro also paid great respect to the Aboriginal heritage of the area, to be covered by Lake Burberry. The West Australian archaeologist, Kelmara Pocock, led a team to the West Coast to study the lifestyle of the Aboriginal peoples, who frequented the area as far back as 40,000 years ago. 
As well as minerals, wood was also taken from the Crotty area. Before Lake Burberry began backing up behind Crotty Dam, the Forestry Commission and private contractors spent years beavering away to salvage the last of the precious commodity, particularly the highly prized Huon Pine. By careful planning, many of the areas disturbed by construction work are now hidden beneath the surface of the new lake. Areas above the lake have been revegetated under the guidance of the Commission's environmental officer. The slopes of Darwin Dam, which faces the globally acclaimed Southwest World Heritage Area, are planted with button grass so that the structure blends more easily into the surrounding wilderness. The race to plug the tunnel in time to catch the winter rains was eventually won by a determined hydro workforce, but only just. The Tasmanian drought broke almost on the day the stop logs went in and the river rose immediately. Another day and that deluge would have been too great to allow the diversion tunnel to be closed for another month or two. A massive rescue operation carried out by hydro employees and parks, wildlife and heritage officers plucked animals from the rising waters of Lake Burberry when the plug finally went in 1991. Because of continuing heavy rain, the lake filled rapidly. Work on the John Butters power station was accelerated and it came online three months ahead of schedule. It was also well under budget, another magnificent achievement in a scheme now notable for them. Tourists are another group to benefit from the King Scheme. The Mount Dukes Road runs through some of the most spectacular scenery in Tasmania, looking back across the wilderness to such landmarks as Frenchman's Cap. And the breathtaking beauty of Lake Burberry on a sunny day has already caught the attention of visitors from all around the world. Thousands of Tasmanians have worked to create the King River Power Development. They endured the cold and wet to drive a tunnel through Mount Dukes to raise the face of the Crotty Dam and the smaller Darwin Dam. They reshaped the Lyle Highway and helped build the spectacular Bradshaw Bridge, named after another West Coast pioneer, Cliff Bradshaw. And they've created a world-class scheme that will provide up to 35,000 typical all electric homes with energy. Here's what a few of them had to say about the experience they will remember and draw satisfaction from for the rest of their lives. When we first started in the tunnel, it was, um, we had the ground conditions were pretty bad and that blocky ground and that. We had to put timber sets in and steel liners. But as we um, got further underground, tightened up a bit now the ground. Really good. Oh, I've been here 12 months and it's a pretty good job. Yeah, it's great. Cold, no, wet. No. <laughs> oh, she's marvellous. Working the fine weather when the road's dry. Otherwise, I'd be out in the bush. Rain's rain, hail or shine. She's great. We've moved since the start, we've moved to about 200 tonne, 200,000 uh, tonne of rock. Um, we have roughly 100 to 125 people involved in the actual running of the of the tunnels that's the the miners and the fitters and the electricians and uh, surveyors and everybody else involved uh, is about that order of people in 1992 the efforts of the hydros engineers and construction workforce are just about complete the crotty dam is finished standing 80 meters tall lake burberry spreads out regally across its 53 square kilometres. The John Butters power station, with a turbine capacity of 143 megawatts, is already contributing to the Tasmanian grid. The workforce, except for the few applying the finishing touches, has been broken up. Some going on to the Anthony scheme, 
others leaving the commission after many years of proud, unstinting service. The hydro construction era is drawing to a close. The King River Power Development will stand as a grand memorial to that era, to a time when Tasmanians brought new dimensions to many skills required to build power schemes in remote areas. The King is dead. Long live the King. <laughs>